All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Species Shorts. My name is Lindsay Barone, and I am an anthropologist that works with the DNA Learning Center. Today's episode is really exciting to me because today is the day that we finally get to start talking about our genus, the genus Homo. And the genus Homo, I think, is one of the more interesting topics to talk about when it comes to talking about human evolution in part, because I think this is where people start to really see themselves in the fossils. Some of the earlier fossils that we talked about over the last couple of weeks, you know, you can kind of see yourself a little bit. You can kind of start to see some of the more familiar human-like features developing. But it's once we get to the genus Homo that we start to see a lot of the unifying human-like characteristics appearing in the fossil record. So for those of you who have been watching over the last couple of weeks, you may recall when we talked about taxonomy and we talked about the scientific name for our species, which of course is Homo sapiens. Now the word Homo in this particular case basically means man. So when we use the genus Homo, a lot of times the scientific name is describing something as something man. So for example, Homo sapiens is wise man. And today's species that's at the core of our discussion is this guy right here. This is Homo habilis. And this name means handyman. And it was so named because this is the first species for a long time that was diagnosed as being a stone tool maker and stone tool user. Now, if you watched Monday's discussion of Australopithecus afarensis, you know that that's no longer the case. But this was discovered long before those Australopithecine stone tools were. The name hasn't been changed, so it's retained that name and retained the reputation as being a stone tool user, which it is. It's just no longer considered the first stone tool user. Like we've done before, I want to give you all a chance to look at this really closely before we actually talk about the specimen in any real detail. So let's get comfortable with Homo habilis. I'm gonna hold it up to the camera so you can get a good look at its face. Make some observations about it. If you watched Wednesday's discussion of Paranthropus, think about how different this face is compared to that. Here's the side of the skull. This is what it looks like from behind. And then, of course, the classic under skull shot, so you can see what the teeth look like. And of course, here is our foramen magnum. Now, Homo habilis as a species was found in primarily eastern and southern Africa. And the species dates from about 2.5 million years ago until roughly 1.6, 1.7 million years ago. So this is relatively more recent than anything we've talked about in species shorts up until this point in time. Homo habilis as a species has a lot of very modern human-like characteristics but it also still has some characteristics that are a little reminiscent of the Australopithecines. So there's been a lot of debate about whether or not this particular species should be classified as an Australopithecine or not. Right now, it's pretty much settled on being a member of the genus Homo. Um, however, if you read some of the historical anthropological literature, you might actually see some references to this being considered an Australopithecus. But I would argue that it's not. I would argue that it's probably correctly assigned to the genus Homo. So what physical characteristics do we know about this species? Well, we know that it was relatively small bodied. If you think about what we talked about with some of the earlier Australopithecines, they were probably roughly three and a half to four feet tall. The same goes for Homo habilis. These guys weren't huge and their weight was relatively small as well. They likely as adults were around 70 pounds or so. 
which is a lot lighter than your average modern human. So relatively small, relatively de delicate hominids. Um, we know that these guys are starting to have a much flatter face. Um, you can see we've still got a little bit of that slope in the, in the face, that facial prognathism that we've talked about a little bit, but it's nowhere near as dramatic as say, with this guy right here, our Australopithecus afarensis. So you can kind of see how that is flattening out. And in fact, this is one of the diagnostic characteristics of our genus. We're starting to develop a very flat face. Now, another thing that's really interesting about um, Homo habilis is, of course, its teeth. We've talked a little bit about the tooth row in the hominins and how some of the earlier hominins, like Artipithecus ramidus and Australopithecus afarensis, have these very parallel U-shaped jaws. Homo habilis, it's starting to get a wider jaw, so it's starting to be more parabolic, but it's not quite there yet. Um, you can see there's starting to be more space between these back molars. Um, it, it's really, it's not quite modern human, but it's not quite fully Australopithecine either. So it's, it's very clearly got its own type of dentition. Um, one of the other things that you can see on this skull is that it's got a relatively flat brow ridge. So we've talked about that brow ridge, also known as the superorbital torus before. Um, this is not nearly as big and as bony as we see in the pre Homo species. So this eyebrow area is starting to flatten out a lot. However, unlike modern humans, we still don't see something called a nasal aperture. So basically, if you feel your own nose, you can kind of feel how up at the top or what we might call the bridge of the nose is made out of bone. And then it becomes sort of soft and cartilagey. You can kind of move it around a little bit more. Having that bit of bone to help shape the nose is something that we really don't see much of until we get to modern humans. And you can see here, this is where that bone would be. It would kind of project off of the nose, but Homo habilis doesn't quite have that. Now, I said before that Homo habilis was named after its stone tool manufacturer and the idea that they were believed to be the first stone tool makers. The tool technology associated with Homo habilis is a style of tool making called the Oldowan tool technology. And this was named after the site of Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. And the tools that are associated with Homo habilis and its sister species, Homo rudolfensis, tend to be very basic very similar to the ones we talked about with Australopithecus afarensis, Oldowan tools are good for chopping and pounding, but they don't have sharp edges. They're good for basically, when I say chopping, that's maybe a, a bad word to use. It's more like they can take them and they can pound something to try and get something out of like its shell or maybe get the marrow out of a bone, try and crack it open like that. So Oldowan tool technology is pretty basic, and it first appears in the fossil record right around the time we see Homo habilis at about 2.4 million years ago. What's kind of cool about the Oldowan tools, though, is even though they're really basic, they actually persist in the archaeological record for a long, long time, well beyond the lifespan of Homo habilis. This is remarkable because it basically indicates that other hominins were picking up this tool technology and because it was useful, because it did what it needed to do, it was able to be used repeatedly over many, many, many years. Now, speaking of unifying characteristics, let's talk a little bit about what makes something assigned to being a member of our genus. So when an archeologist finds a skull in the ground, how do they know if it's a species that should be assigned to the genus Homo or not? Well, there are a number of characteristics that unify our genus. One of those, and one of my more favorite things to talk about, as you've probably guessed, is obligate bipedalism. 
So all members of the genus Homo are obligate bipeds. They don't really spend much time, if any, on all fours, unless it's when they're a baby and they're crawling around. They have anatomical adaptations that really make them very uniquely ad adapted for bipedalism and not much else. We start to have taller, leaner bodies, longer legs, especially in proportion with our arms. Um, that's good for having a really long stride for taking those upright walking steps. That also becomes really helpful when we see the evolution of long distance running later on in the genus. Having these big, long legs to take big, long strides is a very useful thing. Another thing that unifies the genus Homo is a trend towards having a larger brain. And I should say that it's not just about the overall absolute size of the brain, but it has to do with the ratio of the brain size to the overall body size. Because obviously something like an elephant is going to have a larger brain than an Australopithecine. But when you scale those masses, those sizes, um, against one another, that's when it becomes a meaningful comparison. So we start to see this really large brain to body size ratio, and we are seeing the bodies getting bigger just as we're seeing the brains getting very large. Um, so this is an important trait that unifies the genus Homo as well. And that is something, though I didn't mention it, we're starting to see a much larger brain in Homo habilis. So right away within the genus, we're starting to see this increase in brain size, even though we're not really seeing a huge increase in body size with this particular species. By comparison, the Australopithecus afarensis skull that we talked about had a cranial capacity of about 400 cubic centimeters, give or take a little bit. This is closer to 600. So we're starting to get much larger brain sizes. Another thing that we see with the genus Homo that unifies all of these species is that they're starting to have an increased reliance on culture. Now, when an anthropologist talks about culture in this kind of a context, we're not talking about things like opera and theater and literature. We're talking about things like tools. So this is basically a way of saying that tools and other types of things that help out with survival become really, really important with members of our genus. And like I said before, the old Awan tool technology is what Homo habilis is really well known for. Another thing that we see, and I've mentioned this a little bit already, is a reduction in facial prognathism. So remember, facial prognathism is this, having this big snout area actually sticking out from your face. But in our genus, we're starting to see this flatten out. And as we'll talk about over the next couple of classes, you're going to see flatter and flatter faces as we move forward through the genus. Um, finally, a really important trait that unifies the genus is a reduction in sexual dimorphism. Now, we haven't really talked too much about sexual dimorphism, but basically, Sexual dimorphism is when there's a noticeable size or shape difference between the males and the females of a species. And in certain primates, this sexual dimorphism is really, really remarkable. So like gorillas, for example. Male gorillas have sometimes hundreds of pounds on the female gorillas, and they have different shaped skulls. They have really noticeable anatomical differences. By the time we get to the genus Homo, at about two and a half million years ago, we're starting to see this sexual dimorphism becoming really reduced. And if you look around our world today, you can see some variation between males and females. But proportionally, that amount of variation is actually relatively low compared to what we see in many other primates and in many other places in the animal kingdom. And that begins very early on, right away, with Homo habilis. All right, um, so that I think is everything for today. I know I just threw a lot at you in 15 minutes.
If you have any questions on Homo habilis or what unifies the genus Homo, please let me know. Happy to go over things with you or answer things in the comments. Otherwise, have a great weekend and I will see you all on Monday.